stories. I'm standing outside the ICU doors in a hospital trying to get a glimpse of my father who is lying inside on a standard issue hospital bed with faded but crisp blue sheets. He's under heavy sedation. Third worst day of my life. I'm throwing up in the sink at five in the morning while my mother holds my hair back. I look up at my face in the oval mirror, my complexion waxy and pillared. I feel like the terror itself is trying to fight its way out of my system. I've spent the entire day approaching members of my society and telling them over and over again that I'm being sexually harassed. No one listens to me. May 22nd, 2019. I'm sitting in the women's cell of the local police station next to the assistant police inspector. The constable has just taken my statement. I'm cold, hungry, and exhausted. I have filed an FIR for the first time in my life, and it's given me diarrhea. It seems strange that the three most traumatic days of my life are centered around one man. One man, virtually a stranger, who, for some inexplicable reason, had become obsessed with me. In early 2016, my family and I were renting a three-bedroom apartment close to my college where I was pursuing a degree in law. My father, an ex-fighter pilot from the Indian Air Force, had just retired from military service and taken a job as an instructor at one of the most eminent flying schools in India. His job needed him to stay far away in a small town where the flying school had been set up. At home, it was basically my mother and I and the dog. From 2016 to 2019, I was stalked and sexually harassed by a man from my society. Our society was situated on a hill, an arrangement of four 11-story buildings standing haphazardly on uneven ground. The only public access road was highly visible, so the comings and goings of residents could be monitored at all times. In my case, it regularly was. He had the uncanny ability to know exactly when I went out and show up there. To this day, I wonder how he knew. Who was telling him? I marvel at the gall of all those who enable stalkers. I have worked in the field of women and children rights since I was in my early 20s. I remember my first street harassment protest when I wrote slogans on the road with colored chalk, my body, my space. One of the first things an activist told me was, be smart. In March 2018, he finally lost his wits, grabbed my hand, and tried to touch me in the middle of the road when my mother forcibly broke the hold he had on me. We decided we had had enough. Trusting that a respectable residential society would take action, we approached the chairman, the secretary, and the manager of the committee. We even took the initiative to politely request the boy's mother and ask her to intervene if she could speak to her son and ask him to respect my space. We could end the matter there. Instead, the secretary called up my mother, shouted at her, and warned us not to go to the police. We would not be able to prove it. We should talk it out with the boy and try to see his side of things. What? Who says that? She's in the call by asking us to think of the boy's future. There was no thought of my future. The conversation was so shady that it led to us to believe that this lady was up to something. She seemed complicit in my harassment. I was grievously ill after making the complaint.
I had final exams in 15 days. I barely got through those, surviving on electrolytes and biscuits, but I was determined to complete my education. Then my father came home to see me, worried about the complaint before he could do anything about it though. He was struck by violent seizures. My father suffers from a neurological disease and is dependent on medication. When he forgot to take his medication because he was stressing out over me, he ended up triggering his condition. We had to rush him to the local hospital where he was in the ICU for three days. He then had to keep under observation for about a week before we could bring him home. For six months after that, I did not step out of the house. I fell into a deep depression, the kind that comes when those who are supposed to protect you fail to do so. I believe it's called institutional betrayal. I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome due to extreme stress. I suffered from migraines, nausea, heartburn, and diarrhea, fatigue, and dizzy spells. I was living and constant fear, fear that my stalker was casing me. He wanted to know what I wore, who I spoke to, where I lived, and who I lived with, and when I went out, what car I drove, the place I worked, my friends, the sound of my voice, and things I talk about. Stalking and sexual harassment are simply the preliminary steps a criminal takes so he can do what he's ultimately out to do, like abduction, murder, or rape. I spoke to a women's rights activist who told me I had done the right thing and that it should work. She asked me to wait and see if my stalker had gotten the message and would back off. If he did not, then I needed to start recording him in the act whenever I went out and he showed up. I should have my phone with me and record him while he committed the crime. This was very sound advice because if and when you decide to go to the police, you must have proof. From September 2018 to March 2019, my mother and I deliberately and diligently recorded him whenever he came too close. We found out that he had filed a complaint against me for intimidating him. It seemed like speaking up had offended him in some way. Instead of ensuring my safety, his family and the society members were choosing to shield him. They had undoubtedly emboldened him. We realized we needed to move to a new place as soon as I finished college. In 2019, just as we were about to move into our new home, the secondary contacted us. The boy and his family were planning to file yet another complaint against me for breach of privacy. Again, she suggested rather smugly that we should talk to the boy and give him a chance. The woman was practically crowing. So gleefully was she at the thought that she had cornered me into talking to him. I still remember what I said to her. That very night at 10 p.m., my mother and I went to the police station and filed an FIR. We had ample proof. First, we had complained to the society and asked it to put a stop to it. Second, we had witnessed my doctor and my best friend who was an advocate and could collaborate. Third, we had electronic evidence, months of videos of stalking. Last, we had my prescription for antacids and sleeping pills. I'm still on those. The policemen at the women's cell were truly incredible. They helped me go over my story until I could recall every detail with clarity and give them a true account of everything that had happened. They arrested him immediately and put him in lockup for nearly 12 hours. 
He was let out on bail later. They conducted the investigation thoroughly and within a week filed a charge sheet. They took me to the Sessions Court where I gave my witness statement to the Judicial Magistrate. I actually stood inside a witness box and cried my heart out. I talked about how I'd lost three years of my life, how I had no idea what I was going to do with my life anymore, how I was too sick to find a job or get married, how I had to leave within a few days of filing the FIR and move to a secure home. As the police had told me that this man was mentally insane and therefore dangerous. On a side note, they also told me that it seemed more like a conspiracy to force me to marry the stalker than anything else. Here's what you need to know about my stalker. He already had a girlfriend, and his girlfriend knew what he was doing, yet she supported him. His mother knew what he was doing, and yet she harbored him. The secretary knew what he was doing, yet she defended him. There was never an apology. Any man who stalks and harasses with impunity does so because there are women who approve it. Victimization of innocent girls is a hobby. It's entertainment. Sexual predators are not born. They are made. It is not men who are sexually deviant. It is society which is sexually deviant. After I moved into our new home, the peace and quiet was unbearable. I couldn't believe I was actually safe. I was hyper vigilant. I had panic attacks. I had nightmares and flashbacks. I locked doors, took no calls, refused to go out of my apartment, broke off from my friends and stopped eating. I would get very angry. Then I'd suddenly start crying. I would cut vegetables for lunch and hold the blade to my wrist. I'd lean over the balcony railing and lean down as far as I could go. I'd calculate the number of sleeping pills it would take to never wake up again. I'd look up at the ceiling fan and imagine hanging from it. If I went to get groceries, I'd have this sudden urge to throw myself on the road in the way of a car. I was having a nervous breakdown. When I started therapy, I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. The day I started healing was the day I accepted that I was safe. I had not let him get to me. I had not let him hurt me. I did the right thing. It wasn't my fault. I was okay. I was going to face him in court one day, and I was going to see him punished. I needed to live so I could see how justice was served. I could let go and move on. I got my degree in law and a diploma in counseling. I started my own business as a legal consultant and counselor for women and children. I started a support group for women's mental health. I devised a safety plan for victims of domestic violence. I did an online workshop on reporting sexual harassment. I became an activist for gender equality and mental health. I took whatever had broken me and then I remade myself. Today I feel gratitude not for being stalked and harassed but for knowing what to do when it happened. I feel grateful to my parents who raised me properly. I am grateful to my teachers who taught me criminal law, to the API and constable who helped me, to my support group who showed me empathy, to my doctor who treated me, to my therapist who helped me heal, to the judge who listened to me compassionately, and to the women's rights advocate who empowered me.
This happened to me during my first year of university in October. I was living in the dorms and I need to give you a brief rundown of the dorms. You need a key card to gain access to the specific floor. So even though someone on the third floor and fourth floor live in the same building, they cannot access each other's floors. I had injured myself playing sports, so I was under orders to rest, which meant no Halloween parties for me. Pretty sad for a horror fiend like myself, but to try and make the time a happy one, I busied myself helping to make costumes for people and doing their makeup. Once I was finally finished, I packed up my makeup and decided to watch some movies in my room. A guy popped up and introduced himself. We chatted a bit and exchanged email addresses and I walked back to my room and said goodbye. The first warning sign was that he walked into my room behind me despite me saying I was going to walk into my room. I felt really awkward and tried to say in a roundabout way that he needed to leave but he wasn't getting the hint. I finally had to say, you need to leave my room now. I chalked this up to him, maybe being drunk or something, but I did wonder how he got onto my floor if he wasn't with anyone partying. Before I went to bed that night, I checked my email, and there were five from this creep. The first being, hey, I'm so glad we are friends, and the rest asking, why I was not online. A few days later, I got a knock on my door when I was studying, and it was him. I explained I was studying and needed privacy. He tried to walk into my room again, but I braced my arm on the frame and said firmly that I needed to study. The next day, he was at my door again, and the next. I began pretending that I was not home. Another day, there was a knock at the door, and when I checked the peephole, there was no one there, and I assumed the postman had come. I opened the door, and lo and behold, it was the creepy guy. He was hiding from the peephole, so I would be more likely to answer the door. I told my roommate never to open the door if he was there and I told the people living in my floor that this guy was beginning to creep me out. So if he wanted to get on the floor, whatever sob story he gave them, don't let him on. A few days later after that, I was on the bus coming home and I got a text from someone who lived on my floor telling me not to come home because creep was on my floor and was sitting in front of my door just waiting. I went to a friend's house and spent the night and when I got home I was told he waited for four fucking hours before leaving. At this point I was getting freaked out. A few days after that he began waiting outside the building and if I left he would follow me whenever I went. I was too spineless to tell him to go away and I tried to be more passive about it. I never spoke and never gave any indication I was paying attention, but he followed me to class, the cafeteria, and always tried to follow me home and get access to my floor. I went to the resident advisor and told her what had happened. She spoke to the RA of his floor and was told that the creep had been telling his own RA that he was best friends and that we were dating. My RA tried to explain that I was uncomfortable, but the other RA believed him and told him that was that. Thankfully, one thing did deter him. He would never approach me if I was with a group of people. So my floor mates banded together. If I went to dinner, I went with my floor. And if I wanted a drink or seconds, someone had to come with me. 
Walking to class and even waiting for the bus was done in a group. He got onto my floor once when someone else was coming home and he forced his foot in the door to let himself in. I was hidden in another room and when he left my door to go and sit down in the television lodge to wait for me, I went downstairs and ran around to the other side of the building and got into my room before he noticed. Then the phone calls began. I never gave him my number, but he somehow obtained my mobile. At first, it would be one or two calls a day until I told him I wanted him to leave me alone. Then the calls began coming in every hour with him begging and bleeding to talk to me. Without caller ID, I needed to answer the phone because of school and my part-time job. At this point, it was November and I was wrecked. I was tired of having to plan out doing simple things like going for food or walking to a bus stop. Stress wasn't helping me recover from my injury and I was losing weight and I just looked sickly. I went back to the RA and begged her to help me. She went to the head of dorms and explained everything that had happened. I explained how far this had gone and my roommate told them that he was following me a few times demanding that she tell him where I was. I felt awful. She never told me this because she was afraid of upsetting me further and I felt like I was an asshole for putting her through this shit. I don't know what went on behind closed doors from what I guess he was told to leave me alone and any further contact would result in him being kicked out of the dorms. There was one email where he went insane on me, telling me how awful I was and how could I do this to him. We were happy together. Surely I was cheating on him with other men. After that, nothing. At first, when I'd see him around campus, I would run to the women's toilets to hide. I'd see him around town or on campus and he'd always just stare at me, never tried to approach me, never tried to get my attention, just staring. I used to walk by and try to pretend I did not notice him staring at me and I'd try and act like my heart wasn't pounding. If you are new, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe to my channel as it really helps me out. And if you are already subscribed, welcome back and thank you for subscribing.